Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Always glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad so, you made it. Is is that topologies of the flesh I see behind you on your bookshelf? Um, yes. If you're looking at my bookshelf, yes, yes, it is. Um, it's back here, right there. Yeah. I haven't read it yet. It's it's on my it's it's on my list of uh, books to be read. Okay. I I have quite a list. Usually I have a big stack here, <laughs> but I was working working it off until I uh, I mapped out our Aurobindo reading today. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did that look to you? Uh, it. It's 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 very nice. It's very well thought out, and it's you know it's pretty well spaced and everything. It's just uh, it's just a tome. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Indeed, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's all right. You know, I've I've waded through tomes before. <laughs> it's a bit like. Is that this tome? That's the that. one underneath. I'll pick up this. It's the one underneath it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We we don't do just as John says heavy cognitive lifting. We it's actually it's actually lifting. And physical lifting as well. Yeah. <laughs> see, this isn't the kind of stuff you can like lay in bed and read. Because how do you hold it up? You know? <laughs> it's like, it's like doing curls. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, nah, yeah. so anyway, yes, yes. Hmm. <clears throat> well. So who had the question about uh, how, how I'm using Lynn Claire's work? Because that was, that was John asked that, but he wasn't the only one that was thinking it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, to... To be honest, it's it's taken me a few years to digest it. It's not, um, you know, stuff that you go, oh, I get it. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> That's what I was reading all after. <laughs> uh, I I was I was trying to find a way to um to bring it into my language work. And um, in fact, the, the first time I met Lynn Clare was with her, her middle author, Yuta Brender McNair, um, who actually has been working on a language aspect. But uh, to tell you the truth, I haven't, I haven't been able to quite figure it out yet. It's, it's the part of the work that's, you know, like the seven functions and then the sub functions. And, mm -hmm. and it was just sort of like, ah. Oh, really? <laughs> um, so uh, the, the short answer is uh, I'm still working on it. <laughs> still working on it. Yeah. Well, I, I can, I can understand that. I can but tell. My you. intuitive sense says there is a connection but yeah. the, the the brain, you know, chugging through the um, the thinking stuff of you know how how the connection actually manifests, um, I, I haven't gotten there yet. It's a little, that's a little, that's a little tougher. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm chewing on that as well. I can I can relate very well. Um, that's what I when Claire had posted something earlier, I responded to, and and for me, it's like I read it and it's like it makes sense. And I'm going, okay, that makes sense, but I don't know what it's telling me. And and so and then I and I sit there for the longest time going, okay, well I'm, <laughs> could, could we put a little meaning on that sense? You know, it's kinda of like putting sauce on the spaghetti or something, that would be nice before I can, you know, digest it. It was and, and so it's it's it is a little difficult because it relates to other things that we have been talking about here as well. Um we've been talking about a lot of things, but when we were she also knows Stan Tenen and, and Mero, and, and and his his it's a he's got a not thing going, say. And so I spend a lot of time. I get my head all knotted up um, uh, when I'm doing that. And 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 so that was the other thing I was reading earlier this afternoon <laughs> was Mr. Tenen because I'm trying to 
I'm trying to see how they kind of fit together, where they're related, because they, they both have Tauruses at their at their center. Yeah. And trying to try and, as she put it, to ride the Taurus is not an easy task. It's probably easier to ride the mechanical bull down at the bar. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm guessing though I'm not a cowboy, so you know, whatever I have to say about mechanical bulls, it should be taken with a huge grain of salt. But um, and that that's where I, I I I don't know how we get from one to the next kind of thing. I don't know how you know. I I like to. It talks about process, and to me, well, process should be mapped out somehow. I should be able to follow it. I should be able to like zoom along, and I find myself tumbling and turning more than than getting along. Though, you know, she she also has seven primary functions in the process part of her model, and I'm, I was wondering because we had read Arthur Young's uh, Reflexive Universe. Well, how does that map to his process model? Because he also has seven stages in that. And, and Tenen uses Young in what he's doing to help try to make it clear. So I'm going, okay, well, maybe that's, that's a route that I can explore to, to, to maybe try and, and map some of this, this out. But I, it, it became perfectly clear to me this afternoon. I still have a, a long way to go. I don't know, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just getting over the initial headache, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. It just so, sometimes I mean I don't mind it when my when my brain hurts. You know, I, I that's not like a bad feeling to me. Um it happens more often. The older I get, the more often it happens. <laughs> I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that as well. But you know, it's actually a it's a very good feeling to have your brain hurt. But I I also recognize I, there's more than just the brain in here. You know, that it, there, there is a, an encompassing something that takes in, you know, a lot of the other things that we're talking about. The, you know, I'm a big head, heart and hand guy mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And so and, and that encompasses that because, you know, it, 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 it's all connected. And what I'm looking for is to see, well, OK, well, how, not just that it fits together, but how does it work together? That's the, the thing. And, and I've only got about I've only got the first six chapters down, I guess. It'll all become clear before the end. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was that moment well, that was when, when Linclair did a hand gesture. And mm -hmm. it, it was like, um, you know, deja vu, because it brought me back to the Meru uh, presentation that, that, that you led, <laughs> that we did, where you were doing the same thing, the yeah. Filipino wine dancing uh, type of movement. Right. And... Uh, <clears throat> That, that to me, was a clue for what the interconnections might be and how things might begin to match up because it had to do with fundamental forms or fundamental um, – they're, they're movements, really. They're, they're movement patterns. They're traces of, of, of movement mm -hmm. which um, can be, I think, perceived. Uh, this is what I un understand from Lynn Clare's experience, can be perceived in some kind of state of – primordial unfolding right like going mm -hmm. from the one point to the line to then the three-dimensional structure or the you know the uh i guess it becomes a, a a quadrant uh which then like unfolds and there's a generative unfolding mm. it seems yeah. and that that unfolding can be described in formal terms and apparently also i don't you know i, I haven't followed the logic in mathematical uh, physical terms. Uh, and what I see Linclair doing is <clears throat> attempting to translate from those formal operations uh, into a kind of applicable, pragmatic uh, program of some kind, uh, programming of some kind, mm -hmm. uh, where the kind of elegance that's uh, apparent in that in that generative unfolding at the formal level it is recapitulated uh, at other you know scales or, or levels of, of reality or existence. So the social, the educational, uh, and you know the cultural, and so on. That translation, though, like how you get from one to the other, that's yeah. the that's the gap that I, I I can't just quite no. articulate really. And that's where I'm wanting to. That's where my questions really are. Like how does that exactly work uh, mm -hmm. when you go from, you know, show me this shape and then it 
you know, it translates into an educational like paradigm. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious because it's, it seems to be looking for a grounding of methodology, uh, a grounding mm-hmm. of practice uh, in um, universal cosmic, you know, primary forms. Uh, and perhaps it's, there seems to be the, the idea that, the, you know, our, our structures get twisted, warped, bent out of shape, deformed, um, they become deficient, and they need to be regenerated. And so where do we look to for instruction uh, on the you know, healthy way that forms are generated from simple parts to more complex? And that, that seems to be what is going on there um, in a nutshell. Uh, but nutshells are, uh, you know, as you know, um, uh, potentially uh, illusory. <clears throat> kinds of uh understandings so um there are whole trees hidden in there yeah, right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, you got it so so that hand gesture you know yeah. that did, the fir- the very first time i saw that was um it was lou kaufman who was showing it to us um, I, I used to belong to this little group with him. That's how that's how I okay, connected man. with all of this. As he was showing that to us as the spin of the electron. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which is very nice. So I, now I know what one half spin kind of sort of looks like, but I don't know what it means yet. <laughs> like, that's great. You know, and it's like, okay, and <laughs> Ed, Ed Franken does that too in the Love of Math. There's a video of him during one of his math lectures making that gesture, and the same I don't. Gesture. Hmm? That, that same gesture, that that wine dance, that twisting yeah, thing, whatever that is, it's a, it's yeah. a real archetypal gesture. Lots of mathematicians are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like you know the why. <laughs> <laughs> or the twist. I these every week there was a new kind of dance form. And I think this is, I, I just want, I missed the beginning. I, I, so I'm a little late. I don't know how you guys started this off, but um, I just, after listening to uh, Lynn Clare's pr- presentation, and um, I, 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 for some reason I kept hearing this voice in my head. Uh, Plato, Republic, and then I, the 10th book. And I remember that that was one of the first descriptions of a near-death experience in history was recorded in that chapter. And so I looked it up today, and I'm not going to read all of this, just a few, a few snatches from it. He, the, the guy died in a, in a battle. His corpse was piled with all these other corpses for 10 days. Um, they, he was a, a newly, anyway, they put him on the funeral pyre, getting ready to burn him, right? And he wakes up <laughs> to everybody's horror. <laughs> and he tells this story about what happened, which some are hypothesizing, uh, you know, Plato took this and the allegory of the cave comes out of this man's story. But basically he says a whole lot of stuff. But he gets to the, um, there's a, there are people coming from heaven, there are people coming from the earth, and they sort of meet in this area, like a meadow, and they have conversations. Of, well, those who came from heaven talk about how beautiful it was. Those who came from the earth talk about how horrible it was. <laughs> they have all these stories to swap. And then after about, the, about eight days, as he says, um, they go on this journey where they can they are looking down on a column of light that stretches over the whole of earth and heaven, more like a rainbow than anything else, but brighter and more pure. And it goes on to talk about uh, the, the bonds stretching from the heavens and the light binds the heavens like the cables girding a trireme, which is one of those old ships, you know, with the galleys. And anyway, I can't get all these images, but then they're talking about, Eight, he talks about these eight spirals and they're concentric within a larger spiral. Then they're t- and then it goes on and talks about these sirens who utter a single sound 
and there are eight of them and they're attached to each of these spirals and the concord of the eight notes produces a single harmony. Then it goes on to talk about the three daughters of necessity, the past, present, and the future. And then there's a sort of lottery where people, you know, sort of get an assignment, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of wiggle room within the assignment about how the assignment is uh, going to be conducted. And a lot of the people who come, a lot of the souls who come from heaven uh, evidently are very quick to uh, grab a, a, one of the lottery numbers that uh, indicates a life full of riches and wealth and all that. But they fail to read the, the what happens in between is often a lot of <laughs> murder and rape and, and um, you know, crime. <clears throat> and which, of course, sends you into, uh, you have to pay for all your errors, evidently. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I'm just sharing this because when um, Lynn Claire talked about, didn't you talk about the rainbow? Mm -hmm. I believe you asked about, uh, you referred to the void and sort of posed the, her relationship to the void. And um, she then spoke about the rainbow. At any rate, I... I don't know well, what I, you do know that she's had three near death experiences, right? She's yeah. died three times and come back. Right. Which is why I'm sort of bringing this near death experience from Plato, which is one of the first in history that's been recorded. I'm sure there were many before him, but there are many people now because of medical resuscitation who are reporting more and more near death experiences. Yeah. There's, there's, I don't know if there's a, some, some common motifs or not, but I think this is um, just interesting. Um, yeah. and um, I'm very interested in what, cause she was talking about the eight, the eight links, right. Or the eight logics. She seemed to be saying that each, each the number form. eight just kept pumping. Yeah. Each form had a kind of logic mm -hmm. and that each form fitted with the other forms. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that idea of the rainbow and, um, uh, well, the platonic also, solids as well. And the Kepler solids, these mm -hmm. are, um, those are the forms, yeah. Mm -hmm. At any rate, I think there may be a history here of um, an alternate, alternative history, perhaps. Um, and uh, it seems to me that the, the ancients and, um, you know, the, uh, the Gnostics and the Neoplatonists, the Neo they've all been kicking this stuff around. And uh, it doesn't seem to be that anybody's... Uh, come to any grand conclusion at all. So we're in very good company. <laughs> we're, we're, we're baffled, but I think Plato was pretty baffled by it too. So anyway. Um, she does have, uh, she writes about her near-death experiences uh, in some books that are available on Kindle, if you've got Kindle. I think one of them is called Footprints in Eternity. Um, where's my phone? Oh, well, anyhow, I, I can I can get you the titles. Yeah, just throw them in the form there. Yeah. <laughs> so did did we have, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm so out of it, but did, did we have reading for today? No. I didn't do it if, <laughs> if we did. <laughs> Full disclosure. You, you didn't do it well, because we didn't. <laughs> I, I want to thank Marco for insisting that we not have one for this week. <laughs> that, that was that was the well, nicest thing that happened all week. <laughs> but, but I feel a bit frustrated because I need I would like to have some sort of framework for this conversation. Yeah. Uh, and for me, since nobody sort of we didn't do this prior to this conversation, um, but I would like to wonder if anyone has learned anything over maybe the last, how many episodes have we had? 20 mm -hmm. of this particular conversation? Yeah, I think this might be if, number 20. If anyone has learned anything, I would like to know about that. And that's pretty broad, you know. Yeah. You may have learned that you didn't learn anything at all. That's great. That's something. Because I, I feel like we, I'm, I'm, I, I have a real resistance to not having a plan. Even if you decide to change the plan, it's to me, I, my relationship to the void, 
like you asked Lynn Claire, it's an antagonistic one. Mm -hmm. I um, and I feel like some of my uh, some of the postmodern thinkers that have been so influential in, in the world that I've been working with tend to get annihilated by the void, uh, and it ends up in postmodern drift, which is probably why I'm so eager to do something different, anything but that, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and. So I am um, just letting everybody know if I uh, appear to be a little bit over controlling a process or trying to provide a structure. It's sort of like when you see writers who are who give numbered lists of items, which always is a sign to me that they're imposing an order that doesn't exist. <laughs> but I certainly appreciate it because I find, I find a numbered list very soothing psychologically yeah. like the the lists i make endlessly that usually end up at the bottom of my laundry bag mm -hmm. <laughs> no. but i think that it's good to have numbered lists even if we can't even if they don't necessarily uh, organize anything uh it just gives yeah. us some kind of direction i hope i'm you, making some sense mm -hmm. how do you define the void well it's sort of undefinable but you you know you know it if you've been there you know, <laughs> uh, I, I haven't. I've been in. Um, I, I've been in a, what I would call a black void. Okay. But I heard voices, and they weren't all in English. And it felt very much like a an electrical current. Um, there was no inside or outside really, but there was. But the voices did have a direction. They found they were from above. And, but they were also, so it was sort of like, the end, there was no d clear inside or outside, but there was a sense of above. There was something above. So there was some sense of an inside and an outside. There was some, some kind of direction. And that voice told me certain things. That voice told me about some things that were going to happen and that the relationship to those happenings there was a relationship between those, those things that were going to happen and something that had happened. And um, I was then prepared for certain disasters that did occur, but they didn't annihilate me or, or um, devastate me because I sort of had this episode in the void. But the voice didn't speak. It, sp it was a cacophony. It was almost like, you know, when you're in between radio stations and you haven't quite found the right one, uh, you'll hear like snatches of song, a little bit of a symphony. You'll hear a, a, a sports caster's voice, you know, speaking in Spanish or, or another language. And then all of a sudden I heard this very clear English syntax. It was a male voice and it had a th and it carried for me an authority because what else was there? Nothing. <laughs> it was just the void. So that, so you 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 have to interpret these experiences, and you're no doubt are going to do that with a lot of uh, experiences that you've already had. And so I, I regret deeply that I've had a lot of experiences where there was music being played or there was mathematical formulas that I was, but I don't have a talent for math or music, but I think some people do, and they're able to make you make use of that. So I, so I think a lot of this is like idiot savant territory. I know um, we, we know idiot savants, that's a probably a very, a very vile word to call them an idiot, but uh, there, there are children or young people who can't tie their shoes, but they can, there was the uh, calendrical savants, they were able to predict the next thousand years when a certain day would fall on a certain date, and they could do it faster than a computer. Um, so they're freaky kind of uncanny capacities that some people have. But these uh, two calendrical savants were uh, in a play. They were in their playpen. Their mother, who was a very neglectful mother, gave them a Rolodex calendar to play with. And that seems to be something that they bonded with. 
and so they were able to enter into this field of all possibilities. That was the one possibility that they were able to exploit. So I'm very curious about that. Anyway, that's just my spiel, because I, I have a funny feeling that um, we 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 have we may have access to a great deal that we don't know what in the world to do with. Uh, so I think our our uh, humble earthly experiences actually give us a repertoire of skills that if we intend, we might be able to tap into these fields of all possibilities with an intention. And then we, we do indeed, I believe, shape those fields as those fields shape uh, our, our knowledge, our capacity for knowledge. But it isn't, a, I think, a, a top-down, uh, you know, managerial control structure. Uh, I think it's much more fluid and dynamic than that. And I'm not saying we're, we, we're totally, uh, I, I don't think any of it's predetermined, but I don't think it, uh, it's all an accident either. So I think it's somewhere in that, what, what is it Bateson called it? A, sto a stochastic process, it's ordered and it's chaotic. So I, I have a funny feeling it's sort of like that. But anyway, we're meta modeling here. So this is my attempt at, well, what is it about all of these models? What's in between all these models? Rather than just looking at one model, it's like what's happening when you have more than one model or a, a, or a repertoire of models? What are they pointing to within the model and what are they pointing at between the models? And I guess we're the ones who have to decide what that is depending on which models we're, we're most attracted to or which models we keep returning to. So I guess each of us is going to be meta-modeling in a different way, which only adds to the, the, uh, the complexity and maybe the mess that we might, we might start making. Because <laughs> it certainly could drive you crazy. So I, I certainly appreciate people who feel like they're coming close to burnout because um, I've burned out many times myself, personally. I think you can fry your brains doing this stuff. So I, I was at a conference in Albuquerque at least a decade ago. Um, and it was, um, it was a round table conversation um, with basically some Native Americans and some Western scientists, physicists, anthropologists, linguists, people like that. And the leader was a guy named Leroy Little Bear, um, who's Blackfoot, I think. And he, he would always start these sessions with uh, a question. And the question at one of them was, what if we don't have consciousness, but we are within consciousness? And, and then he brought up your metaphor, your exact same metaphor, which is why I'm bringing this up, that we tune in like... On a radio dial, we tune in to a certain frequency of consciousness. And what if we can tune in to other frequencies? And so that's what we spent, you know, a couple of days talking about. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that that metaphor is a metaphor that you and I share. Plato wouldn't have used that metaphor. And he didn't. Right. He used different set of metaphors. So I think that's interesting too, that, that our technology, hmm. we tend to use metaphors that are technological. Yeah, and yeah. Whichever yeah. history, and the history of technology is a very long one. So we don't dream about bows and arrows. We dream about radio transistors. Mm -hmm. oh, speak for yourself, John. I <laughs> <laughs> I have bows and arrows show up my <laughs> in my dreams. That's when it gets very very primal. But but I think I think the the if if we can like hone in on one word for that, it's it is attunement. So if we take that as a the general category, 
Plato might talk, you know, they all talked about harmony in the spheres. Music played a much bigger role in their lives than it does in ours because technology plays a big role in ours. And so we do transistorize and we tend to think of circuits and things like that. But there's a, I, I'm a very big fan of, of attunement. You, you tune into things. You harmonize with them. You resonate with them. You you get kind of on that some kind of a, a vibrational frequency with them that, that matches whatever it is that, that, that you are tapping into. And so, you know, it's easy for us to understand when you say, well, it's like turning the dial and you hear all the, the cacophony, but still something comes through. Because if, when, and that's one of the problems we have when we're reading older, older writers, and especially people like Plato, is that we don't relate as well or as easily to the metaphors because we're so pre we always take ourselves with. And as modern selves, we, we go in there with a whole set of assumptions that, that don't really fit for what they're, what's going on there. And, and we got to, we have to chuck those off. That's, that's my whole hermeneutic thing that I keep going through is, well, get rid of all of the dross so that you know what it is that you're actually working with and then find some kind of notionality that will help you with that. And so we, we, we attune. And, 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 and when we do that, things do come through. And, you know, because, you know, I hear, I hear Lisa talking about, well, what if? And I'm going, is it otherwise? You know, I, I, I don't see why that's all so odd. <laughs> really, because I don't know, I don't know that I, whatever that is, and this is one of the things that the postmodernists, that John and I, we share our dislike for them in, in many ways, because they took things apart without the intent of ever putting them back together again. And so it becomes very Humpty dumpty -ish. And that bothered me, because, okay, well, that's fine. I, you know, you, you can take everything down to its illogical end, but that doesn't mean that that's the end of it. That's just, that's one path that you pursued and, and okay, and, and what? What do I do with that? Oh, I got it. I've got this, I've got all the pieces there, and what do I do with it? I can't put it back together. Well, that's not very helpful for me because for me, in my limited state of existence, there's a tomorrow, and that tomorrow actually needs to have something in it that is put together both, you know, and I can form in some way that I can use to, to do whatever I'm going to do. So that's why I'm always looking for people that are helping me to, to put things together. Sometimes it's very hard to understand how those relationships are. That's the, that's also my, my wrestling with all of that not stuff. Is they're all tying things together, but I don't see what they're tying yet. You know, I haven't gotten gotten that far. But having said all that, I would really like to hear what Mark has to say. Because <laughs> <laughs> he he's been lurking, and we're not going. You're not allowed to lurk when you're here. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just listening. <laughs> yeah, I know. You call it listening. <laughs> no, well, I'm trying to, trying to pay attention. I, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to go back and look what you posted on the David Foster Wallace essay, the commentary on it, and and it wasn't the essay per se, but someone talking about it, and and the main point, and I think you're all saying this, the same thing, is he believed you were capable of, of deciding what you paid attention to. Hmm. And that's sort of with your radio dials, uh, you're, you're spinning the dial trying to find a good signal that, that you know, something... Uh, Let's use the word resonate. I don't like that word, but everybody knows what it means. So, right. if, you can, if you can find a good one, I'll use it in the future. Believe me. <laughs> <I'm laughs> um, with you on that. So, like, you know. so you spin. You know, you're driving across the west or whatever, and you spin the dial until you get a clear signal. And then, is it something you like to listen to? Uh, is it country music or talk radio? Or, or sometimes there's some. There used to be. Who was it? Dr. John or something late at night? <laughs> Anybody listen to that? <laughs> but, you know, you're just spinning a dial and then all of a sudden there's a clear signal and, and yeah. you know, away. 
and it's dark everywhere. There's no light, you know, except for the headlights. And uh, uh, that's an interesting experience. And also the radio frequency. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the law of attraction, Esther Hicks. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uses that as, as uh, you know, getting in tune. And, and, and if, I, if I'm down with something, if I'm open to something, I think it's the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that uh, just might be real. So carry on, folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wanted to respond a little bit to um, Ed and uh, our mutual um, antagonism towards the post, to the excesses of the postmodern. Um, because okay. I understand the, the attraction to deconstruct a pathological situation. You want to take it apart. And, but you need to put something back together again, or someone else will. And the, the reconstruction might not be very pleasant. Uh, and I think this is the, uh, the antagonism that a lot of the postmodern unleashed because there was a desire to preserve pluralism. These uh, attempts at universalizing this ne these neoliberal globalized regimes, which is basically capitalism run amok, um, was resisted. And that resistance was, um, I think, a healthy resistance. And I think a lot of those in, people in the postmodern were uh, responding to that resistance. Uh, but I think that wanting to preserve pluralism and to point out the, uh, the, the pseudo, the pseudo, pseudo universalisms, they weren't universalisms at all. They were just some corrupt regime trying to impose something on others like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan with trickle down economics, which were, they laid the foundation for that, which we're all enjoying the benefits of right now. So I'm wondering, you know, I think a lot of the postmodernists were very legit, and they were a lot of them are scientists as well as uh, social theorists like um, Maturan and Varela. They were talking about auto autopoiesis, self organizing theory. Uh, they were very reluctant. They talked about the postmodern drift. Is they 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 didn't like the idea of uh, a reconstructive phase that could be used for political purposes. They wanted to keep all of that autopoiesis in the realm of biology. They didn't want it to become polit political because they were both uh, refugees from that Ch Chilean revolution where you know this, the American CIA basically um, took over uh, Allende's ademically, uh, uh, a democratically elected government and the CIA uh, crushed it. So I think these, uh, those who had gone through that experience. So this is once again about transdisciplinarity when we go from biology to sociology, uh, to, to the arts, there's going to be overlaps, uh, but it's what we do with those overlaps I think that makes for this transdisciplinary um, effort that some of us are really attracted to. Because you know we may not be physicists, we may not be biologists, we may, may not be sociologists, but all of those disciplines are shaping our lives in very direct ways. And unless we get up to speed enough in these disciplines so that we can ask questions about what's happening in between these disciplines, I think that we're going to be, we're doomed. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, you know, I think we're just uh, gonna have to get off our ass. <clears throat> And, and because no one's going to do this for us. And I think we're all probably uh, have inherited a factory model education like the theorist Jen and Jennifer Gidley, we've, some of us we've read. And she's, uh, looking, at our, she's looking at education and uh, this factory model that, that has created this, uh, these fractured uh, disciplines, these disciplines that are disconnected from other disciplines. Um, she's she's looking for a post formal rationality that is uh, moving toward multiple futures 
rather than one um, neoliberal future for all, as unequal as it is. Mm. That's all there is, so get used to it. <clears throat> so she's proposing that there are multiple futures and there are many different pasts. There are alternate pasts we can um, uh, observe and relate to and resonate with. And I think that's really important. And as, as a gay person, that's been a key to my, my, my survival and the and other gay persons or, uh, or any minority that has been persecuted. You look for alternative sources of knowledge to validate your, your current situation and the possible future that you, that you want to create. And it's not inevitable. I mean, so I've repeated over and over again uh, what we were up against in the 80s um, during the AIDS epidemic. Um, because I think it's important that we were not realistic. Mm -hmm. People who told us, be real, I said, fuck you. This has never happened before. And um, I worked with a desired outcome, what I wanted to have happen, not what I thought was possible. I wanted a, what something, something that had never happened before. I think that's where my, um, uh, something that I'm trying to integrate and something that I've learned in this forum with my colleagues here has been um, my opportunity to experiment with a des with desired outcomes and multiple desired outcomes rather than trying to solve problems, usually at the level of the problem, which generates more problems. <clears throat> so um, I guess that's, and, and to see that, and to, and to get feedback from others has been extremely welcome and that I've been able to do these little uh, social experiments has been a, a, a great source of uh, inspiration for me. And um, because I, I, I do believe that's going to be a very important, not that we won't, but I wanna make it clear, having a desired outcome actually creates problems, but they're different problems than the problems you will have if you're just trying to solve a problem at the level of the problem. So in a way I'm for generating different problems. And I think we need desired outcomes in order to generate different and more interesting problems. And um, I think we have lots of opportunities to explore that. Thanks. I'm rather surprised, John, that you're such a troublemaker, but. Um, <laughs> I am, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, but, but, that, but that's, that, but it's good. You see. It takes one to know one though. Oh uh, yeah. I, I, I'm a firm believer that whatever we learn, we learn in spite of school, not because of it. And, and I, 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 I've spent a lot of time in school, either teaching or otherwise. But to go back to something that Mark said, it's like, call it the law of attraction. You can call it what you would. To me, there are basic principles that are at work. This is what I see in Mirror. This is what I see in, in uh, Lynn Clare's work as well. There, there are fundamental, I don't understand them yet. But to me, the, the principle works. This is one of the things I'm getting out of the book. The principle works regardless of the domain. I don't think we have to get smart about sociology at all. I don't think we have to get smart about anything. We have to, get, we have to, we have to tune in to the principles. And when you know the principle, it always works. It doesn't matter where you are. You know how it functions. And, and, and to me, it's, this, it's, it's not a reductionistic reducing. It's a... It's kind of like a distilling, mm -hmm. you know, you, you distill it down to its essence and you realize that this is just like that, even though this is in the political realm and that's in education. It does, it's the same thing that's going on. And being able to, to, to work that, to, to recognize that and, to, and to, to tune into that, if you will, is, is important. Now, and what I hear you doing is what, what Mark just said, the moment you say, I have a desired outcome, what, what you've done is you've built a little antenna and you stuck it up in the, the nose for whatever the, wherever the hell it goes. And now <laughs> you're looking for, and the signals will come. That, that, yeah. That's what they, that to me, that's, this is how it works because that, that's how this whole attunement thing works. And so you start getting input a lot, and a lot of times, you're absolutely correct, John, we haven't the slightest clue what we're supposed to do with this stuff that's coming in. 
because mm-hmm. it's just like we don't under. I remember we were driving through uh, in in West uh, England when my back in '99, and we were cruising along, and we tuned in the the, the radio to a Welsh station. Now I don't speak Welsh, and neither does my wife, and we listened to that for hours because it sounded good. I have no idea what that did to us and our lives and our psyches, but <laughs> but that that's the signal that was right at the time for what it is that we were doing, and 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 I think that all everything that we do, the moment you intention is 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 the word, and the moment you intend to do something, you've already unscrewed the the bottle with the genie in it. You know, it's just a matter of whether you take the cap off or not. Right. To, to me. But that's the principle is that once you send it out there or once you verbalize it, once you initiate it, well, the cosmos, the co- whatever it is in hell you want to call it, will will respond. And then we have to deal with it. That's why we have to be, you have to be, the, you magicians there in the East, uh, East Coast, they have to be careful for what you wish for. You just might yeah. get it. <laughs> that, that, now that's, that's the big, that's the first thing anybody will tell you, be careful. You know, <laughs> you don't know, right. you know. You have to be very careful about what you ask for. That's it's right. Gonna come. Because you're going to, it's not good. Having a desired outcome, like I said, does not solve. It's not out to, it creates different kinds of problems. It's, it's a whole, and it's a whole different ball of wax. Yeah. But if, I think if, if there are more than one player is, uh, you think you can mitigate the signal. So <laughs> if, they're, if they're intending uh, a similar desired outcome, I believe that has, that amplifies the feedback in the system. Um, because it wasn't just me who wanted a gay parade. Otherwise, it would just be me walking up and down. But the first parade I went to, this is in the, in the 70s, there are about 800 people. Uh, a few years later, there are a couple of thousand. Uh, five years later, there were 200,000. Hmm. Ten years later, there were a million. And now it's beyond a million who show up for the Gay Pride March. And so I'm just saying, those are the, what I think are uh, another, someone else we're reading here, uh, the minor gesture, those little bitty nameless acts of kindness and of love they accumulate. And I think if enough people, and I'm sure there have been lots of them, who, who, who are unremembered and don't have a, you know, a Nobel Peace Prize or an Academy Award, but they made those nameless little acts uh, and they added them up and they have, a, they have an impact. And I'm sure we're all benefiting from uh, a, a lot of those efforts. So I think those minor gestures that we make, um, even if it's as simple as declaring a desired outcome to a group of friends and drawing a picture of it and showing it, that to me is a minor gesture that gets amplified in a, in a group. And since I, I believe many of us are attracted to collaborative efforts, collaborative learning, I think that um, the symbolic modeling and the clean language exercises that I've been doing with some of you in this group have, I believe, uh, they're minor gestures, but they add up. And uh, I think we am- we can amplify our feedback, and we can then it becomes d- goes in deeper into our neurology. But we can create a a map, a model, a, a sign that we can then share. Then then that that little drawing coming out of your internal process, making a drawing, it becomes a communication that others can resonate with. So I think uh, I-, I would just like to have more of that happening in and doing it better. Um, so I, I believe this could be e- extremely generative and has been generative. So I'm just sort of saying how my, how I'm taking all these theories and meta theories and meta models and trying to enrich my own prax- practice because I think it's an ecology of practice um, that is, is going to be very important because we can come up with theory after theory after theory and so what? But if we don't have any applications, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very concerned that we'll just get into cognitive overdrive. So I think our bodies are here. These, the, have a, there's a vast somatic intelligence 
that our factory educations have disrupted um, because we prize so much the cognitive. So I, 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 it's my expectation that as more of us get tuned in to these different levels of our, of our soma, um, we, we can start to have that field effect, our, our relationship, the mind, the mind and nature can start to coordinate in different ways. So we may have serendipities and synchronistic events. If our minds are prepared, we can pay attention to them and notice them. I, I, so I think I'm preparing our minds and um, paying attention to those tiny minor gestures can uh, cr create an opportunity to amplify a learning that gets grounded. So thank you all for letting me have this opportunity to, to rehearse this stuff because you know, some, so much of it just get, can get lost in these sort of free association games we all play. So I, I just wanna like point to some of the dynamic reference points in our uh, communal efforts here that uh, unfortunately we have the technology, we can share this stuff, we're, we're taping this stuff so we can play it back if we want to and parse it and deconstruct it and reconstruct it in, in, in interesting ways. So that, that's my expectation, my hope. Oh, uh, another thing, Ed, you talked about looking at something over here and looking at something over here that are the same. Mm -hmm. I, I would just change that slightly and saying there's something over here and something over here that are similar. No, I, I think, think they're the same, John. No, I, I actually, I, I think no, I think they're the same. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I, I meant it the way I said. <laughs> I know. I, I think this is a difference. Mm -hmm. I think this is a difference that might make a difference. Maybe not. Maybe not. But I don't see, I, I hardly ever, I don't think anything repeats itself. Nothing is the same. It's all similar. And these well, are this every, is what time you drop a, every time you drop something, it falls to the ground. And it all falls to the ground at the same rate. That's just the way gravity works. Because there's a principle, and, that, and that's why it is the same. It doesn't matter what you drop. And, and if, I, if I take... If I take around like politics and education, for example, they're just people, they're people involved. The, the, the emphasis that they have is slightly different, but what they're doing is actually the same, but not just similar. It's not just an, it's not just an, I, 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 I agree with you. There's a real power in analogy. This is like that. But I'm, I'm getting slowly to the point where it seems to me that this is that, and that it actually is the same. Would, would that be... It, let's say maybe to another degree of intensity, if you will. Would, would that be the same thing? If it's the same, is that a law? What is the relationship between that sameness and a law? I'm, and where I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that there's a difference. That's why... The word law had fallen, but I, I was I was avoiding that. I, I I don't know how I feel about laws right at the moment. Well, that's and what I, I think. We're talking about the law of gravity and th I understand right. it. I'm I'm still wrestling with that you, one. But you, so you, you, I am I am too. Because principle. The difference between a law and a but habit. I, I, that's why I had chosen principle. To, the word, you, yeah, the word you used was principle. Was and principle. I was going to ask you. We we don't have to go there yet now, but I'm curious what a principle is. How, how do you know principle? Does it have well, a that's, that, see, that, <laughs> you, you've, you've kind of un, un, uncovered all thing. It, it's just like you know, with Mark and the word resonate. You know, I don't like the word either, but it, hel it helps describe that to other people. So I could use the, I could probably speak and talk about a principle and a law and, and whatnot all at the same time, being internally torn between them. But um, knowing I, I don't, because I don't know how to express it yet. That 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 sameness. But is, here's where like Whitehead is interesting, right? Because we get the idea of something that looks a lot like a principle or a law, but is doesn't get reified into what the mental does with those notions, which is turn them yeah. into eternal, unchanging, completely independently, <clears throat> uh, you know, factors of, of the okay. universe. So, you know, through the process philosophy kind of, you know, approach, 
uh, those become habits or patterns. Mm -hmm. There's room to imagine there's some kind of quasi space to imagine them being different in another universe with different initial conditions. Maybe gravity wouldn't work uh, the way that it does in our experience. Mm -hmm. Moreover, there's the empiricists, um, I guess, approach or the, 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 the empirical critique uh, of that um, you know, notion that the event will repeat itself the same exact way every time because you can't actually perform that experiment. Um, so there, you're, you're performing, there's an inductive leap there. And, and I think that if we're in that realm of kind of figuring out the, the, the logics involved, uh, we're, we're in a mental kind of space. And what is actually going on uh, can't be reduced to those categories. It can't, it can't really be parsed in those terms without um, maybe cutting off, you know, uh, dis discarding, uh, in some way squelching the, 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 the freedom aspect of it. And that's even a kind of a principle uh, to speak of it that way. But that raw potentiality you know, which I think is that void dimension as well. Uh, it's, it's that dimension that is prior to form, it, it, not temporally prior to form, but ontologically uh, mm. prior to form. And even there, you know, we can get into a sort of logical paradox because, you know, what is prior? Um, that, that's what I thought was really interesting to me about Lynn Clare's experiences as she described them, because uh, I didn't take them to be um, mental, you know, postulations about how the universe works. Uh, she, she, she seems to be communicating an experience, a perception. Uh, and and I, when I asked her a question about the relationship between the Marion matrix and the void, uh, I use that word perception deliberately because it, it, it re to me it reflected maybe something about how she experienced it, uh, but I don't know exactly. So I'm just I was testing that 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 word out, um, and I'm interested in the question still of what we've learned through through these mm -hmm. through these conversations to to come back to that and what we're attuning to and and the radio metaphor. Uh, and also things I p I've picked up on, little signals I've, I've picked up on when I, when I turn the dial and scan what's going on, the, kind of the new, newospheric, you know, uh, kind of local newosphere. Um, I, 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 I had the interesting experience, and it was a bit fragmented because I, I couldn't get like one block of time, but to, I had the experience of listening to and watching John, your talk with TJ and Doug. And that was about reading at your best and um, like what is happening in that experience and why are we attract, why do we, are we attracted to it? Why do we, you know, why do we kind of, it's more than an attraction actually. It's <laughs> kind of, you know, we, this is where what we were talking about at the very beginning before you hopped on, uh, Lisa was noticing the books on, um, uh, Ed's wall, and uh, you know, we were taking out our books and looking at how big they are. <laughs> and, and you know, perhaps somewhat intimidated by the you know the 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 scale of what we're kind of you know dealing with here, our bindo, irreducible mind, and so forth. Um, and I I. I I think that you know part of what um, I'm learning is how to f perhaps flow a little bit more with the the way that signals transform, because you know as is happening when you're moving, when you're traveling, you you, you you the signal fades, the signal shifts, it changes. You move from one. Um, uh, you know, emanation zone into the next, uh, you, you, you know, you were, you thought you were listening to Led Zeppelin and now it's, um, you know, gospel preacher. <laughs> uh, you didn't notice the transition. <laughs> right. and, 
and so we have to kind of reattune, right? And we have to, we're, con- we're dy- constantly like dynamically reattuning. And I think also when you're doing this in a group, you're attuning to each other and you're kind of co-attuning. And in a way we're acting, and this would be for me a desired outcome. This is sort of a fictional dream becoming in, in a sense real is you're, you're creating a kind of a, a stronger um, antenna. I mean, just the way that, again, this may be more than metaphorical. It may be, I, don't, I, I would still, I would err, err on the side of similar to the same, but the way that NASA creates arrays of telescopes to um, capture a distributed signal and then, and then bring it together into a, a coherent, you know, high, more highly res- resolved image of, of what, you know, they're looking at. I feel like we're doing that in a no- neospheric capacity and that part of the exercise that we're going through doing these cosmos cafes and the reading groups and um, the, all the various interstitial conversations that happen, the kind of spin-offs and the, you know, the side conversations and the private conversations. I mean, the, and of course those all being connected to all of our life world contexts, which, you know, expand way beyond these particular gatherings that we we can attune to more subtle signals. We can attune to more distant communications. Uh, we can perhaps even develop some, um, you know, collaborative filtering techniques to kind of cut out the crap and the noise, but get at least enough of the crap and the noise that you know what's happening uh, uh, and, um, you know, aren't caught uh, blindsided, you know, by something you should have really been paying attention to but weren't. I mean, th- there's a practical, I think, media media spheric um task to do because this is the the field of activity really for us for us humans and not just humans but you know all of us like we are in a we are in a field of infinite you know constant communication going in all in all in all directions and and it has the character of of being um you know a a, stru- a suffering uh, a, a strifeful place, uh, especially in our particular moment, and so I, I feel that part of what we're doing is not just creating spaces, but we're also c- building some kind of culture that allows for access to signals that are more informative, more you know wholesome, more life uh, sustaining than the. Um, the kind of you know what to call it exactly, but but uh, um, spiritual warfare type of uh, commu- you know, uh, communications, media broadcasts uh, that really have come to um, predominate. I think in, in our in our general you know the human landscape you know at this at this time especially. So being able to attune to ancient. Uh, what we would call ancient sources uh, and to reconstruct these kind of fragmentary signals that we get from different authors and from different times and places and, and turn them into reconstruct them into a signal that makes sense that more than doesn't just make sense cognitively, but, but carries, you know, carries life. Uh, that to me would be a desired, that, that's a desired outcome. And, and, and for me, that's a creative act. That's an artistic act. Like I want to take in signal, and and, and then put out signal, uh, because I think that that that's the way to kind of connect, you know, beings into networks that are more that can become uh, matrices, you know, for for healthier culture. Uh, and that was the other part that came through your your talk, John, with TJ is, and, and TJ's particularly, which would be really great to follow up with him on. He was correlating Gebser's fourth dimension. Not with a not with a sphere per se, but with culture, and I, I, um, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, to me, that is the work that that's the regeneration that that we need. We, we're in a dying culture. We're in an ex, you know an, ex, an exploding culture, a very sick culture in many ways. We have to create alternative spaces where where good, where good culture can flourish. And what is good culture? That's aesthetic, that's an aesthetic question. That's an ethical question. You know, that has all kinds of, I mean, that's a very deep question. Uh, and 
um, we're not going to answer that here. We, and, and besides, even if we answered it, we'd still have to enact it. And that's really where it counts. So, um, so, so sometimes I, I think we have to, you know, let our attention drift a little bit to find a, find a signal. Like you, you have to search a bit. You have to allow kind of that, that space. You have to allow some void to, to, to mix. Uh, and, and, you know, as we know, there's sometimes noise in signal and signal in noise. So it's not, you know, one signal fits all. It's a, it's a ratio between signal and noise. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're talking about same, the sameness and the similarity and difference and, and laws and, you know, re regulation. Uh, rules, uh, what happens when the rules no longer apply. So I think these are deep human dilemmas. Uh, and many of us probably have had experiences which we call synchronistic or serendipitous, where uh, the so-called laws that we perhaps agree with because they allow us to function um, are disrupted and something else comes through that does that's anomalous, that does not fit. So we can ignore those anomalies until there are just too many of them to ignore, which I think is where we're at right now. So um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm wishing, I don't know if um, Lisa is still here. But yep. Oh, you are, thank I you. I see you. I maybe, see you. <laughs> maybe you can help me with it, Lisa. Yeah. Look there's, up, John. <laughs> there's, the, there's the same or similar there's ne there's both the same and the similar there's neither the same nor the similar these would be different logical games am i right yeah this, yeah this is sort of what nagarjuna was doing exactly um, we don't get, have to get trapped in an either or i say it's the same i say it's similar <laughs> there's <laughs> polarity response potato potato well, Right. Okay, so so this is this is really amazing because uh, I've been sitting here like waiting, like what's the best time to like jump in with this? Please, now, you you jump there first, which um, says that okay, you know, there's there's a resonance happening within the group here that we were, we were both kind of feeling the same thing emerging from the conversation and um to be able to uh one to be able to see that that you know same and similar or even same and similar and difference are all part of a unitary structure you know like like you can you can put same and similar on the mobius strip in a way and look at, okay, similar has to do with when you're looking at things from um, the local perspective. You know, it's, it's similar, you know, when I drop this pen versus when I drop, you know, this feather. Um, it's same when you look at the global, when you look at the situation from the global perspective and you're going, yeah, right, it's, it's gravity that's acting on both of them. Um, and... And so it's no longer either or it's like, oh yeah, well, you know, there's this sameness aspect of it and there's this similar aspect of it and there's this difference aspect of it. Um, and, and the three are part of a unity and, you know, we don't, we don't yet have language to, to really uh, express, you know, how all of those are part of the unity and are unique and so that's that's a little antenna that i'm putting up like how do we do this in language <laughs> it's a spiral antenna it's like a mm -hmm. yeah. one of the <laughs> <laughs> kind of looks like a wine dance on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Hmm. and also that it gets more complicated if you're if you're looking at um, visionary episodes where there are lucid dreams or near-death experiences, or there's a different, ki different kind of body, um, there's a gross body, a subtle body, a very, very subtle body, as in um, 
the, 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 the tantric traditions, mm -hmm. the hybrid body. Um, some would say they, these are on, there's, these are on a continuum. Um, I would say they're on a continuum rather than it's either physical or it's something else. I think that, that there's a, a definite continuum. So, so that in, so in subtle experiences, there, the laws of gravity do not apply, but sometimes they do. You can have a dream where you're walking down a country road and you can hear the gravel uh, as your feet touch the road. Um, and you can also look up and you can see, see the sky and the clouds and say, you know what, I think I'll fly. And you can. Um, I remember in one episode I had, a, I was in a lucid dream. I was really exploring like the microdynamics. And I remember I went, first of all, I walked down the country road and I could hear the crunching of the gravel. And I looked down and there were no feet. Visually, I could see nothing there, but I could, I had the kinesthetic sense of feet. I had the auditory sound of the gravel crunching. I walked into a, I walked in, I saw a little lake, I put my hand in it and I swished my hand back and forth and it had a sensation which was like water, but it wasn't exactly like water. It sounded like water, but it didn't, it wasn't exactly like H2O from planet earth. And I walked into a room, I walked into a house, I asked, is anyone home? Nobody was home. I opened up a cupboard, I pulled out a glass and out of curiosity, I, drew, I opened my hand, see what would happen. And it fell to the floor and it shattered. But I saw it shatter, but the, I heard the glass shatter. There was about a two second delay between the visual system and the auditory system. So these kind of little micro analysis that I did over a long period of time really convinced me that, that these are different, these are different some of it's the same, some of it's different, and I believe there are different laws apply. <clears throat> um, I'm not saying that the subtle realms are without laws or rules or regulations, um, but I think there's, uh, I do think there's a lot of feedback that goes from the subtle to the, to the, the physical waking world. But I think we get trapped into making the mistake, as Eric Weiss says, that, the, that the, we, we mistake the waking world for the physical world. And that's a mistake. I think the waking world is much vaster. And um, I, feel, I believe we're in a very unique time where there are many people who are having out of body experiences and near death experiences and lucid dreams and synchronistic events, um, tele, tele, telepathy, uh, remote viewing. I believe all of these capacities, which I think Gibson would call coming out of a magical structure perhaps, uh, I think we can um, do all kinds of comparative contrast and comparative kind of studies on this. And um, I'm just very curious what would happen in our futures with a plural, if there were more people who, um, you know, turned off their smartphones and started to explore their neurology at a much, in a much more sophisticated way than they are by watching these flat screens or looking at their smartphone or, or, or getting a, addicted to TV, uh, I think there's a whole lot of stuff going on in our, this fast somatic intelligence that we haven't even begun to explore. And much of it has been suppressed and for very good reasons. I mean, what would happen if everyone were telepathic? It would be a disaster. I mean, there's some things and that is very good that we were able to forget. We don't want to release all of our amnesia. Amnesia is a protect, protects us from forgetting stuff that's traumatic and not useful. So these are the kind of paradoxes I think we're going to find ourselves in more and more that, um, um, you know, is trend. I don't know. I, I sort of am attracted to an open society. I don't know if I want a transparent society. I do want to be in, I want to have some secrets. You know? um, but I think more and more people who get telepathic and psychic and can do remote viewing. Um, I think that's going to be, become a different kind of ethics is going to be required. And may, there may be very healthy reasons why we've suppressed these capacities because <clears> we don't have a high uh, a cosmo ethics to go along with these 
uh, these capacities, we will we really be in deep trouble, more trouble than we're in. So maybe we're working this out. We are with all this stuff going on with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Uh, I mean, that's a very rough working out. I mean, the ethics that are going to be required are, you know, way beyond what's going on there. <laughs> but it is way beyond Clinton or, or Trump, that's for sure. I think the kind of ethics that are going to be required are planetary ethics. So I think when we're, when we're moving from a, we were talking about globalization or planetarization, how those are different kinds of language games. So I, I think this globalization, which I think is just a buzzword for neoliberalism, is, um, is extremely corrupt. And I think we need to get, I'm wanting to move more towards planetarization. I, I haven't quite fleshed that out yet, but I know there's some theorists out there like Gidley who are talking about planetarization or like William Irwin Thompson who's talking about planetarization as a, as a contrast to um, globalization. <clears throat> so that's another theme we could possibly develop. Yeah, I think the difference is in how we view the other. You know, if we view the other truly as totally other, we have one set of ethics. If we view the other as, as um, you know, a different facet of myself, um, we wouldn't treat the other in all the horrible ways that we treat others. Uh, however, you know, we label and demonize them, you know, uh, according to whatever our shadow is. I think you work this out in your, in your novel. Some of these uh, mentions. Yeah, I, I, I tried. I mean, I started, you know, the, the very basics of it. I think, I think Levinas has kind of taken it on, um, uh, in a more, you know, philosophical and systematic way. Um, have you read any, any of Levinas? Um, some, uh, just a little bit. I'm not well versed in Levinas. I'm, I'm not, I'm not either. I, I have, I have one of his books, uh, here otherwise than being and yeah I i've got that comes one. through it yeah. uh also totality and infinity I'm, I'm quite interested in that because there's this thing with the other where it, it's very it's it, it can be easy to fall into reducing the other to the e even to the self the mm -hmm. other's not the same as, as as the self uh maybe not even similar it could be extremely other so we we still have to recognize selfness or some uh, what to call it uh, binding quality. Some like there's something that is shared between mm -hmm. when 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 another is encountered that you know, may not have a um, a name uh, uh, because to name it might be to reduce the other to yeah. you know an occasion of your a projection of your own you know, system. Uh, <clears throat> May I? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. But I mean, j j just to close that thought. Um, well, go 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 ahead. I don't know, I don't know exactly I mean, wh where I think. Okay, I, 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 I'll try and yeah. be brief. Uh, to the question of principle, uh, what's happening on your your infinite conversations is. There are principles of small group behavior, and it doesn't matter doesn't matter where the group is or who, you know, if it's over in England or Scotland or South Africa or anywhere. Small group behavior is has principles. People take on certain roles, and so those are principles. They're not laws, but it repeats itself over and over. The principles of small group behavior and we humans pretty much evolved in in small groups and then they got bigger and then their conflict changes the larger the group but all in a, a small groups platoons it's there's a reason that the military has platoons of like six people seven people any more than that it's it, 
you know, you get into, you get into sports and it's very, you know, you have the leader in the locker room. He's not the manager or the coach, but he's the, the, and, and they fragment in the locker rooms, they fragment into small groups. And, and so there's that. And now to the other, I live in a uh, apartment complex, 280 apartments. Let's say there's 600 people. About the only commonality would be income. You have to have a certain level of income. And if you have more than that, you're not going to live here. And if you have less than that, you're not, you know, they won't hook you up. You know, you can't rent an apartment. But I've been here over a year now, and I don't know, I, I don't know a single person. Now, mm. part of that is me. But part of that, and I've only been apartment living for the last 10 years or so of my life. Uh, but I've talked to my son about it, apartment living, and, and, and it's different than being in a neighborhood and, and sharing a, you know, a fence with, with your neighbor. These are different, different group living situations. But everybody here, let's say there's 600 people. Everybody behaves in a certain way. And, and it's cordial. There's like a group dynamic uh there aren't rules but everybody is cordial there it, there are some norms like music and things like that but there's no uh, everybody's just polite you know and and the only time you really have an intimate situation with with you know the people in the complex is in the elevator the ele- <laughs> elevator. Elevators are weird. <laughs> the elevator <laughs> trance where reality it, takes place. Sometimes, it, yeah. Sometimes it, it's a mother with her little kid, and sometimes a guy with a dog. Where it's a it's a single female, and it's you. Uh, mm. Elevators are weird, and <laughs> they're, but they're still a, 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 It's not like a business. You know, mm-hmm. where everybody faces forward and nobody says anything, you know, a, a commercial elevator. Uh, it's a little more relaxed and you exchange sort of pleasantries. And then, but to the transparency thing, I don't want to know these people. I Seriously. And I don't want them knocking on my door, asking to borrow eggs or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. I, and I think apartment living, everybody is pretty much like that. Uh, we don't have, uh, there are communal places, the pool, the fitness room. And, and I pretty much stay away from those because I, I don't want it. I don't want, but if you sought it out, I guess you could, you know, if you're in the fitness room lifting weights and somebody else is lifting weights, you might have a brief conversation. And maybe there's an attraction and you hit it off uh, and, and you become friends, but it's dangerous because, yeah, somebody, you don't want somebody knocking on your door like, you know, they're real chatty and all I want and they're real needy or something. Mm. And I think people just respect that in a, this the apartment living that I've done anyway, I'm sure they're different in different, you know, economic or, 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 uh, you know, parts, this, this place, I don't know. It's, it's the center of the universe. (laughs) (laughs) Northwest Minster. It's almost perfect. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not, it's not urban. It's not, it's just, it's very high tech, very, uh, every convenient, and there's wilderness. I take the elevator down, go out the back door, and it's open space. And you don't have to worry about being attacked or robbed. Or if you don't want to talk to people, you don't have to talk to people. It's just, and there's every franchise within walking distance, whatever you want. 
but there's open space, beautiful views. This is where we're going to put the the actual brick and mortar <laughs> cafe. Your, your your proposal, your proposed location. I'm still partial to the mountains, uh, Mark. And, yeah, I just have to say something about that beautiful goddess behind you. Oh wow! Who is she? I can't. That's he's radiant. That's Great, my girl. <laughs> That's I'm sorry, Defi- I her, her, but her I name, have to say something. Her name is Defiance. Oh, oh yeah, okay. And that's my that's my girlfriend. Uh, wow, it's Marco has given me shit, so I thought <laughs> I'd invite my girlfriend to sit in with us. <laughs> she doesn't <laughs> talk. I can talk to her. Mm-hmm. She doesn't talk back. Something very magical about that. <laughs> well, I think she says a lot. <laughs> yeah, I've, I I saw it. In, <laughs> I saw I saw it as Clay, the artist, was working it, and uh, I said, "I want that." Yeah. And I it took about six months, but uh, I finally got it. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it's defiance. Thank. You. She's kind of the local deity, huh? That's you know, true. like how, how cities have their protective. Well, here's another similar. This is like your space. this is your kingdom, right? That 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 little it's, apartment is your I, kingdom. Yes, yes. In, yeah. ins, inside these four walls, yeah, it's my. Uh, and and I can't. I try and imagine having and living with another person now, and it just be impossible impossible I don't know how you do it I did it once I, I did it you know I had a family and children and uh, but now whew, I don't know well I think this has something to do with the future of culture here's how um, and this may tie back or may not uh, the point about otherness and uh, the mentality of absolutely distinguishing between self and other uh, and you know, creating uh, domains you know, which, are ex- which are exclusive uh, to the other and only inclusive of what uh, most um, pleases the self. Uh, like that, that comes out of, and this is what I've been learning through the, our conversations about uh, Peter Sloterdijk's work on spheres, because he goes from bubbles to globe to foam. You're you're living in the foam phase. You're in like the what? The foam, like you're this little sphere, this little cell. You're living in a cell, in a, in a kind of bubble that's connected with all these other bu- bubbles. That's the apartment complex in, in the metaphor. But he sees this as a historical process. And what he describes in the book Gl- Globes, which we're just coming to com- com- completion on, is the way in which the idea of a globe start- started as a philosophical concept. It started uh, as, a, a, the, as a, a belief that reality as such, being as such, could be described by this one form, this one shape that is perfect in all dimensions, that has a number of, you know, characteristics uh, that could be measured, could be described philosophically, that, ha- that could be described logically. That all takes place in the minds of philosophers in Sloterdijk's telling uh, before it becomes actualized in the, uh, in the globalization of the earth through which the, literally the, the earth is colonized by you know, Europeans especially, uh, and it's turned into a uh, an actual global map of you know of of the world of everything that that we know, uh, and so where this is going, like what we might be working on, to me is we're imagining forms of the future. Uh, when we imagine what it would what it means to be within a tor- within a toroidal kind of reality or within to what it means for our consciousness to be structured like a Klein bottle, something like that. And how do we speak from that? 
I think that we're describing forms of potentiality that could be manifested, realized in future, you know, future realities. Uh, and so the fact that we can pay attention to our own uh, morphogenetic kinds of processes and thinking and that we're looking for the right shapes, the right words to carry, to embody, to hold the kind of experience that we want to have. Uh, I think that that's very significant um, because it's, it, it's happening at that subtle, subtle level that's kind of like pre-manifestation. It, it's pre-accelerating. It's the pre-acceleration before a real reality takes, takes shape. And if we look then at like what's technologically, like the trends, what, if there really is a singularity type of you know, uh, convergence of nanotechnology and biotechnology and genetics and computer science, etc., what we're kind of moving towards is a sort of create your own reality uh, environment uh, where it becomes more and more accessible, more and more democratized, you might say, for people to have their own realities like you do in your apartment. (laughs) And I mean, you know, you could paint, you could probably paint, I don't know what the rules are exactly, but you could paint it whatever color you want. You can have whatever deities you want in your apartment. You could tune in to whatever TV shows you want, watch whatever movies, etc. Exactly. And so everybody gets to be their own little god, right? Uh, and so to me then, that really means that as culture creators, uh, insofar as we have the technological capacity to do so, we're going to create our own hells or create our own heavens, and you know, given the means at our disposal. Uh, and and so it's it's it, I think the work that we're doing from the really esoteric kind of meta 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 philosophical stuff to the much more minor uh, gestures of drawing, moving, convening, listening, uh, we're shaping what our cultures will look like. We're, we're shaping our own futures. And I don't mean that in the Barbara Marx Hubbard kind of conscious evolution sense. I mean that very uh, concretely. Uh, yeah, if we're doing planetarization, that's, you know, that, that has a formal meaning, that is a philosophical meaning, but it also has to take shape in actualization because globalization has concrete relationships uh, that are organized underneath that, that world picture. Uh, and that's everything from financial arrangements to industries to uh, nation states. I want to imagine some a different cosmos, uh, a different world where where that's you know you sm- I want to imagine a, 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 another kind of reality. And that's not to deny the current reality. It's to it's to recognize the power of of the mind uh, and. And I think that what we're getting to with these meta maps and these meta models is we're looking at the building blocks of, of our own aren't, minds. Aren't you busy enough? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the other thing I learned from Sloterdijk is, you know, when, when the idea of a, of a single world globe encompassing all of reality arose, that comes out of Athens and it comes out of tremendously traumatic times. Uh, these are philosophers dealing with the invasions, with um, tyrants, uh, with uh, the, the, the conflict between the, the powerful and, and the rich and you know, the, the, the mob, the masses. And Plato was trying to think through, how, how can we make this work? <laughs> like his, you know, of course, famously, his solution to the problem was you need a really, really smart person in charge. but but i mean that that's unless that's i mean that that may be manifest in the kind of ai idea you know like we we need to have a super intelligence that's just gonna take care of it all for us but i think we're we're kind we're trying to i think what we're trying to do is to um search out other possibilities other other ways that 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 could unfold um because i mean we've played that game before we, we kind of know how that how that ends and well it it's back to ed ed similar and same 
Plato was what? I don't know. 3,000 years ago, he was before Christ. 25. Close. 2,500 years three, ago. Three, three, yeah. Something like that. And, and there were only maybe a million people on the whole planet then. Mm-hmm. And so now we got 7 billion. So, and we still are working on the same problem. And we've mm-hmm. had 2,500 years. And we're, it, but what has happened, there's now 7 billion people. We haven't solved the problem of how people can get along. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. but, it, but it's coming to a head. Mm-hmm. Well, because, because there's so many of us. And the technology, we, yeah, I stay in my little kingdom here, and it's perfect. <laughs> it, outside, everything's, yeah. Air conditioning, I no, heating. I am, yeah. And, and, and it's cheap. You know, <laughs> you know what my energy is? My total bill, total bill. And it's all electric. And I washing machine, oven, refrigerator, mic, you name it. $20 a month. That's it. Now that's, that's perfect. That's uh, hot water. I think they're great. You know, why would you want water is the greatest invention in the world. Mm -hmm. So why would you want anything to change? I don't. (laughs) (laughs) That's, that's what I heard. I, I, I do want, you know, occasionally some conversation and some company and things like that. Uh, but no, yeah, mm-hmm. I, the, what's changing is, 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 yeah, my body and my mind are starting the mm-hmm. downward <laughs> trajectory and that's not, fu- that's not fun. I don't, I, you know, I can't do what I used to do and, and things like that. So, mm-hmm. but I finally, yeah, I did. I got it. I got what I want. So John, mm-hmm. one time you asked, you know, People don't know. No, I know what I want, and I have it. Mm-hmm. Except a little relationship here and there, uh, you know. More than the elevator. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the elevator encounters. I don't know. Uh, and it's not like the movies where there's madness. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't yeah. happen. There's that song. <laughs> Aerosmith's song. Um, uh, I, I just remember as I get older um, I, I do appreciate I my, coming to my little cave and li- lighting a few candles and listening to the music I want to listen to and I've lived alone most of my adult life I've had a few experiments where I tried to live with other people and they were all ended up in disaster <laughs> so I think I think everyone has a different you know ha- um, stimulation certain amount of stimulation comes too much yep. for some people. And so yep. I have a very introverted nature. I like, when I want to relax, I like to be by myself. Some people relax, they like to be around a lot of other people. That's um, the hardest thing is to have a relationship with another person. And it's been that way since forever. What makes it easy or, or, or easier is when you have a common enemy and you can unite right. against a common enemy. But to try and get along with a person day in and day out, that's, we, we haven't figured that out. No. A few people, I guess, George H.W. Bush and Barbara, 73 years of marriage. I mean, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, Two what presidents, a several presidents, you know, baseball teams, oil fields, money up the wazoo. I mean, I guess they figured it out. I don't know. He traveled a lot. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he was never home. <laughs> so, you know, I, I heard as I get older, uh, I, I do notice that um, I love my solitude and I'm not willing to give it up for anybody. That wasn't true 10 years ago or certainly 20 years ago. I would give up my solitude for just about anyone. <laughs> and because I, I had that, uh, that yearning for uh, the other out there, which I no longer do. Uh, and, you know, I feel a little bit totally content in some ways. Uh, but I have my books, I have music, I have uh, 
I hope to enter into relationships with others in a much more generous way rather than coming from a needy place, as I often did, or trying to remove myself from a needy person, as often was the case. But I don't think anyone equals anybody else. We've all been taught that every everybody's equal. Actually, that's a geom Euclidean geometric uh, formula that Thomas Jefferson uh, yeah, tried to the Declaration of Independence. That's but he, of course, was a slave owner, so it <laughs> didn't really, he wasn't something he could live out. Um, but no one equals anybody else, and no one's better than anyone else, and no one's, you know, I think there's a, 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 a dilemma here. But I remember uh, uh, Gore Vidal, uh, he was an elder, elder man, uh, maybe 20 years ago, I was listening, I was looking for older men who I thought were, had a little bit of wisdom, and I couldn't find any. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I'm getting older and older in a world where the older people are not manifesting a lot of wisdom. But maybe I, but I did hear him say, if you've known one person, you've known, you know everybody. If you know one person really well, and I really rebelled against that idea. I thought that's an awful idea. But now as I get older, I start to think maybe there's a deeper truth to that. That if you've known somebody really well and you've loved them, they've loved you, you recognize they're not, they're not equal to anyone else. When they're gone, they're not replaceable with anyone else. I think you start to, that doesn't mean you can't have new friendships and new relationships. I think, um, uh, there's something very beautiful that um, the German philosopher, what was her name? Hannah Arendt. Mm -hmm. she, she became good friends with um, uh, Auden, W.H. Auden, the poet. But they were both in their, their 60s. And she said something very poignant. She said, people in their 60s do not become best friends. That's something that you do when you're in your 20s. You know, you have those best friends and you, you age with them and you grow older and you let go of things and you put up with things. But I think she, she said, you know, that her friendship with, uh, with uh, this poet, this, she was a first, you know, world famous philosopher. He's a world famous poet. They had their friendship. Um, and she, she read a very poignant um, uh, sort of uh, eulogy after he had died. But I think that, I think we're, uh, we're in this sort of confluence of, intergenerational um, uh, missions that get passed on, the baton gets passed on from generation to generation. There's some efforts that have been like that. And those are the, the kind of friendships that emerge out of that, that kind of uh, inter intergenerational mission that you have, or you, you're, you're attracted to certain, you want things to happen, even when you're dead and gone, you still want them to happen for, to benefit others. Um, I think that's a different kind of relationship than the, you know, the kind of, you know, you want to mate with someone and settle down and have a nice house and, you know, do the kind of things that you have to do to make those kinds of arrangements. Um, anyway, I'm just talking off the top of my head because I think that um, the, the opportunities are, are enormous, but there's also a lot of liabilities because I think as we see, I just saw a, an aging generation where there's uh, an epidemic of Alzheimer's, um, we have to really start thinking about what memory is and where is memory and uh, who shares certain memories. And when those that you share memories with are no longer here, what happens to those memories? Um, and our technology, I think our technology selects certain memories and deletes others very quickly. And I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Who decides what memories get captured and stored and retrieved by certain others and not some others? And what are the ones that get deleted? Um, I don't think we have any good answers to that. But that's just an, another concern and a big research question I have. Among many other concerns, but that's a big one now. Well, uh I spent time with my father. He, he died a year and a half ago. He was 96. And one of my oldest best friends, I really only have one maybe, and it's this guy. His mother just died. She was 98. 
uh, and she lives here in, in Denver or did, and he's in Southern California. So he went, well, I'll skip that. But watching, watching my father's memory sort of degenerate over the last, it wasn't until, I don't know, maybe the last four years that his memory started to go. He had a long-term memory, but his short-term memory was totally gone, which I really liked because he'd call me <clears throat> almost every day and we could have the, <clears throat> the most honest conversations because I knew there was no continuation. He'd forget it when he'd call me the next day. You know, I, 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 so I could be totally forthright and honest. Right. But then his, like he got, he married this girl when he was 80, 80 something, 84. 86 maybe and she was 60 something he has no he had no memory of it i had to i had to tell him all about it and he bought this this house with her and he had to, i sent him pictures to jog his memory but it was just i mean that he remembered my mother his his first wife they were together for 50 years and he turned her into a a saint and he just, oh, she did all that. I said, you know, and I'd be totally honest with him. I said, you know, your relationship with her is totally different than mine. And, you know, I, she was my mother. She was your girlfriend, lover, wife, antagonist, whatever. So, <laughs> you know, and he'd be crying. Oh, she was so this and so that. And I'm thinking, man. <laughs> that's not my recollection of you guys uh you know so it 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 goes away uh, and i don't think it's i don't think it's a disease maybe if it happens when you're 50 or 60 but when you get old and it's different diff at, for different people some people their mind might start to go when they're in like mine <laughs> in <New York. laughs> Uh, but he he was fine up until about ninety two, and then it started to you know, and then by the end it was really he he could remember things from his childhood. Mm -hmm. Here's the they were always stories that he had told before, and it, it's like telling fish tales. You you catch some fish, and the first time you tell your buddies about it, it's this big. Mm -hmm. And the next time you remember, and, and they, they were really, you know, it was like, wow. So the next time it gets a little bigger. And by, you know, by the time you're in your 60s or 70s, the fish was three feet long. <laughs> <laughs> and you actually think it was because you mm -hmm. told the story that way. But what you remember is the last time you told the story. The last time it was 24 inches. Well, I'll just add a couple inches. Now it's 26 inches. And then the next time you tell it, it's 28 inches. And the struggle, I fought that fish for three hours. <laughs> that's, just, that's, the way the mind, that's the way the mind works. And actually, he may, just, he may have just seen the, the movie, Old Man... Of the sea, with, with the sea. <laughs> yeah. no, sometimes I've met all times they see a movie and they think it happened to them. Yes, yes. Some children think that way too. I know when I was a child, I'd see a Walt Disney movie, I'd go outside and I would reenact it, and I actually thought it happened to me. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and so same I think it was with magical. Your it's same with your dreams. I mean, yeah. when you, you it, it, uh, when you're dreaming, you think it's happening. And then, and then, if it's bad, you're thank God I woke up. And if it's if if it's really good, you want to go back there, and maybe you incorporate it into your actual life. And so you meet this person who is in your dream, and you start talking to them like what happened in the dream really happened. 
and they're looking at you a little sideways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't have the same drink. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the problem of a shared reality. Yeah. yeah. Imagine and, and, no, and nobody has a totally shared reality. They're all different, non-shared reality. Even if you're at the same place at the same time, like Marco, and, Mar, Marco and I meet up and we have a, a time. If he tells you the story, it's going to be one way. If I tell you the story, it's going to be another way. And when I tell it, I'm going to come out looking pretty good. And when he, <laughs> when he tells it, it's going to be different. And, and mm-hmm. so which one is true? It's a look, all right. <laughs> Maybe a few extra warts and, you know, a few more gray hairs. I don't know. Push your eyebrows. Well, that's, the eyebrow. <laughs> it, 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 you know, that's what's nice about the camera. I mean, when did, when did the cam? I, I have a photograph of my grandmother. It's not a photograph. It's on a tin plate. They, you, you, mm-hmm. they, they put these tin plates and you had to stand really still. And it did this weird thing. And mm-hmm. that was, I think she was 20 years old, and uh, so it was around the tw- turn of the century, the last, you know, 120 years mm-hmm. ago or something. But n- now we have, and now we have video, like, yeah, this. Mm-hmm. Forever. <laughs> so cult, 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 culture and memory. Like, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an intimate right relationship between them and that's that's one of the things that's changed this new technology these things are changing and we don't have any way to deal with it we don't have a you know how do you how do you deal with this stuff yeah i think it's a, a could be very dangerous as you we've, we've pointed out you know what you can do with the technology the distortions and generalizations and the deletions yeah. That you can do with this technology, you can put words into people's mouths that they never said, yeah. and then you can, you know, say this was a true occasion when it really was manufactured. We've always been able to do this, edit things out, but it's gotten really, I think, a lot of people maybe now there's like proof of lies. Right. Well, we can lose our memories. I, a, a, a theorist, I can't remember her name, but she she had cancer and she was. I think she was uh, very sick, but she looked around her and she just said, I think everyone's losing their memory. Um, And I think it's because we're offloading onto our technology, a lot of our cognitive capacity and just letting the computers do it for us. Um, And I think it's usually the cognitive capacity that we're offloading is um, a very limited one. So I think we're, we're overvaluing what our computers can re- retrieve and, and, and re- you know. Di- so I think that's the, the dilemma um, because it's not exactly memory that we're offloading. It's something else, you know, what you can put in, what you can format uh, or photograph or whatever, or an MP3 or whatever. These are, but I think that, that the memory, uh, which is so, what we've been talking about, so elusive and ephemeral, um, and our learnings are really the, the affective and emotional aspect is what we remember. Um, you know, the things that evaporate very quickly, the things that usually had no affect or emotion, but the emotional moments in our, in our lives are imprinted very deeply in our neurology. Yeah. And those are very valuable. Some of them are traumas and we might be wise to find ways of forgetting them. But I think we shouldn't forget the lessons that were learned from having gone through those traumas. I think that's the danger of just erasing those memories that are unpleasant. <laughs> so I, I don't know how we how we move forward with this technology, and and because um, it's it's I love the benefits of it, like we're enjoying today having these kind of creative conversations. But I also feel like um, there's something that we're losing. Well. I don't- when Marco edits them, and then he puts words in our, you know, he <laughs> futzes with it. That's and why then, it's going to be on the 
the blockchain or, or, or something. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be cryptographically uh, you know, verifiable that you really did say that. And there really is a wart on your nose or whatever it is. <laughs> um, hmm. Okay. What do you think, Ed? We're kind of you know closing out, but We're coming up at the top of the hour. Yeah, I, I I enjoyed our little chat this evening because because though it it wasn't intended to go anywhere, it went somewhere, which is what happens a lot with our cafes. They they end up getting there, and I think I think the the things that need to be addressed get addressed in those. And um, to come back to John's question, the mean what have we learned over the past twenty weeks? I'm not exactly sure, but I learned a lot tonight. I got sorted on a few notions and a couple of ideas, and I was able to uh, to kind of reshift a couple of my uh, Legos that I'm trying to put together in my little uh, tower that I'm building here, and uh, that's that's very helpful. This was this was a real good uh, chance to do that. What's on our nose or not? <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually see any words. I'm just imagining them. Yeah. <laughs> That's where yeah. I. That's Any? What about you, Lisa? Anything? Yeah. Um, I'm just. I. I just really love being um, in this group of people who can, you know, uh, take the conversation in so many interesting directions. I love it. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Thanks for, for putting all this together. Well, th- thanks for being here and. Um, Showing up, everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I I wonder if do we feel more integrated? Like, do, do you? I, I feel a little bit more integrated. A little. Yeah. I, I'm not. I won't be totally sure until I get up and go use the toilet. But mm-hmm. um, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. You always feel better then. Yeah. <laughs> All of integration, whatever. <laughs> so, so on a scale of one to ten. 10 being integrated, one being unintegrated. Hmm. Where do you think you are now? I don't know if that, that scale applies, but <laughs> the, the number six number six came to mind Okay, for what that's I was, worth. I was about a two at the beginning of this conversation. I was definitely in the unintegrated. I would say five or six. So it's hmm. moving towards integration rather than, than towards incoherent breakdown. <laughs> Which is always well, a never call a danger. You don't know how <laughs> happy we all are to hear that, John. <laughs> Drag him off to the snake pit, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. That, well, this has been this has been great. Yeah, uh, appreciate it. So all next right. time we don't have a plan for next time, or we'll, we'll we'll work out something, right? If we want to read a paper or something, or yeah. <clears throat> I think that's the task part. If we want to read something and share it, we should make a decision in the next couple of days so that whatever that is, a chapter from a book we've already started or a new book we want to explore, we can have enough time yeah. so that enough people get a chance to, to get the article and read it. So Th- Thursday would be good. I think by Thursday, that gives 48, you know, a couple of days. Mm-hmm. And then, then we have the whole weekend. Yeah. Uh, beginning of the week. Are, are so, you guys interested in talking to Steve Rosen at all? I would love it if you can make that happen, Lisa. I, I'm a big fan of his, as you well know. Yeah. Does, does everyone know him? He's well, written he, this. He's, a, yeah, he's also the uh, Topologies of the Flesh, right? That's right. Yeah, and yep. the Self Evolving Cosmos and. Uh, I, I have all of his books. I have this one too, Topologies of the Flesh. I think, didn't we read an article of his? No. I, we did, didn't we? No. Well, um, well, I referenced... She referred, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. She referred to him and she did a review of that, but we didn't actually read Rosen himself. Um, so uh, I'll post a link to, I did an interview of him. I used to have like okay. a, a, bot, uh, like a internet radio show. Hmm? I think it's that interview. Yeah, and um, I can I can post a link to that. But uh, yeah, so in order, 
this is his first book. It's a novel. Um, and then it was Dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Topologies. And then the Self-Evolving Cosmos. And now this was the last one. Wow. I've, I've, I've read all of them really except fun. Mobius Seed. I haven't read that one. I have uh, to get you're slacking, John. I'm the, disappointed. <laughs> I, I I think his work his oh. work on the Observer is so interesting. If we could find like a your with your interview and maybe an essay that he's written. Okay. Um, pick out something that you think is suitable. Oh, actually, there's another book. Yeah, hang on. There might be. There's another book of of essays that I you know. The, those books, you you really have to like read the whole book, but this one, this one, I think. Um, I don't know that one. That looks great. A chapter. Uh, yeah, this is kind of an early book. I mean, his thought has evolved quite a bit from it. Um, this is 1994, uh, but. The subtitle is The Evolution of a, quote, Transcultural Approach to Wholeness. So that sounds good. That sounds right up the alley of what we've been talking about today. Transcultural sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So. Well. Uh, yeah, I'll look through. Just, yeah, and just um, I mean, post to the forum, create a topic, yeah. send a met. You could send them, if you just want it private, send a message to, there's a group, you're in it, C Cafe. Uh, mm -hmm. and you send a message to that group and everybody who's been participating will see it. Okay. And that could be a kind of seed and out of that we could develop uh, exactly what we would read and, and when and the logistics mm -hmm. and the scheduling, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so that sounds wonderful. And, and, we, and we could invite Stephen? Yeah. I think he would show up and we could have a conversation with him? Oh, I that think would, he'd love it. Yeah. Oh, that'd, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. All right. That's the plan. Uh, and so it may or may not happen next week, right? Because, mm -hmm. but. So Probably we'll still... not. No, let's, let's plan on this for, you know, uh, a few weeks out. Okay. okay. Cool. So we'll, so we'll get together by Thursday and sort of think about next Tuesday. Okay. And Sounds then good. we can plan on the Stephen Rosen two or three weeks from now. Yeah. Sounds okay. good. That sounds good. Cool. Yeah. Good. Thank right. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Enjoy. Take um, care. Grab. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? Leave. And I don't get out of here. Cut me off, Marco. <laughs> All right. I'm going to press this button, and you're going to be zapped right. out of a, okay. out of virtual existence. <laughs>